Good morning. Hi. I'm Borskut Aydnola from Gresham House PLC. I'm an investment director in the Gresham House New Energy Group. Um, and um, for, for those of you who don't know Gresham House PLC well, we're a London listed manager of alternative investments with £2.6 billion pounds under management at the moment. And we're active in the areas of infrastructure, forestry, renewables, energy storage, the opportunity I'm going to take you through right now, private equity, as well as um, uh, small cap quoted equities. My colleagues are here at the stands, who, and they can give you much more information about Gresham House PLC if, if you'd like to, to receive that. Um, <clears throat> I'm here to introduce the, the Gresham House Energy Storage Fund, um, which helpfully we managed to get the ticker GRID for. It's a London-listed um, fund, and it's a fund that has been put in place to capitalize on the, the vast opportunity uh, offered by NG Storage, the growth of NG Storage in the UK. Um, let's start by um, focusing on, on the picture, which shows a typical NG Storage plant um, that the fund owns. And, um, and it would be this kind of plant, plant that, that's in the pipeline that will be acquired by the fund going forward as well. Um, it consists of um, batteries, which are located in standard 40-foot containers as well as the uh, inverters that are uh, designed to convert voltage from DC to AC to, to feed back into the grid, transformers, the associated cabling, and in some cases for hybrid projects, um, uh, gas or diesel generators, um, as well as all the associated cabling and control system uh, operating room, uh, again located in containers. These have typically a very small footprint. They're typically located over one to two acres of land. Um, they have a grid connection to the, to, to the nearest uh, grid connection points. Um, and um, they, they capitalize on the energy storage opportunity by either, either through market-based mechanisms, by trading in the energy market, or through contracted uh, revenue streams. But I will explain in the presentation um, how, we, how we do that. Um, I'm going to dedicate about 25 minutes to going through the slides. And because it's a fairly new opportunity, I'd like to sort of put a larger than normal weight into questions. Um, as I anticipate that there will be uh, quite a few. Um, I will first, uh, firstly take you through the summary. Um, the fund was, um, we're talking about a fund that's, 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 that's already trading. We raised 100 million pounds uh, through an IPO on the, on the London Stock Exchange in November of 2018. Uh, 60 million pounds of that went towards buying already operational projects. So from day one, this fund had a, had a yield. And the remaining 40 million pounds is now committed to another 60 megawatts of energy storage projects which have either been built or about or where construction is about to start. Um, we're here because um, at the moment we're going through a placing of 75 million uh, extra shares, up to 75 million extra shares, um, which are sold at a price of 101p. The fund was launched at 100p and that was announced on the 26th of April. It will be closing at the end of next week on the 20, uh, 24th of uh, May. Um, we will deploy the proceeds that we, uh, that we have raised into opportunities that we already have in the pipeline that are ready to build, um, really with the purpose of minimizing cash drag by the end of Q1 of 2020. So our target is to have deployed all of the funds, the surplus funds that we raised, plus, the, uh, plus what we're raising now into, uh, into revenue earning opportunities within the next uh, 10 months. Um, the NAV total return uh, target for the fund is 8% on an unlevered basis, but we see the potential to, to, to raise that to 15%. The portfolio is unlevered at the moment. As we build, um, bring in leverage, and that's an active stream of work for us. We're in conversations with several lenders. Uh, we, can, we can bring in um, additional returns, and we can bring in additional returns from um, efforts on the revenue side, uh, as well as the cost side and upgrading existing projects, either through getting extra grid connection capacity, which would enable us to add more batteries as well, um, or um, on the cost side, uh, through scale, as we build scale, um, costs that typically start high, operational costs that typically start, start high in new markets, drift down, so um, that will also ad uh, offer additional returns, and we expect to get to, we, can, we expect to be able to get to 15% NAV level returns over time. Uh, financial highlights, the NAV at, at the moment is 99.9p per share. After the IPO, it was 98p as a result of the, uh, the, the launch costs. We've announced our first dividend of 1.4p per share. 
that will be payable at the beginning of next month. Uh, that's part of the 4.5p that we have committed to and for which we have reaffirmed our commitments that will be paid this year. Um, and the underlying, so far, the underlying revenue performance has been very strong uh, for the funds. Um, we're working on upgrades to deliver uh, incremental returns. And on a technical basis, our plants have operated very well. We've had 99.95% availability uh, on the plants uh, until, until today. From an operational point of view, I will take you through a revenue stream called Triads, which is a, a market-based mechanism designed to reduce volatility on the grid. Um, we have earned three out of three of those, and that's really contributed to our, our strong uh, revenue performance. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're already working with lenders on bringing uh, debt at, at portfolio level, uh, debt of up to, with, with up to 50% uh, leverage. Moving on to the key investment characteristics. I mean, firstly, um, you know, unlike um, energy uh, funds, public funds in the energy sector right now typically offer access to uh, renewable power generators or, or other generators, and the risk investors are taking is the risk of power prices as well as um, subsidies, you know, what will happen to subsidies over time. Um, this is a completely different proposition. This is a, an asset-backed proposition, just like uh, investing in other areas of the energy sector, but it is a play on the volatility of the energy sector, not on absolute power price levels and not on subsidies. As a consequence of the huge deployment of renewables, as I will show to you, volatility has increased and all the, um, you know, all the factors are in place for that volatility to increase and we need a mechanism for that essentially to, to be able to reduce the volatility on the grid and energy storage plants can do that and also earn very strong uh, returns in the process. Um, the, we, the fund offers a quality income uh, yield, it has a high EBITDA margin and it has a diversified cash flow profile. We're not dependent on any one revenue stream. We're dependent on a revenue stack with a degree of transferability between different revenue streams that, um, that reduces risk. Um, the fund, in our view, has strong capital growth potential. The seed assets were acquired through as a result of an independent valuation process at an IRR of 12%. That compares to IRRs of less than 6% that are, that are used, actually it's a range of sort of 5% to 7.5% for renewable generation assets, around 8 to 9% for merchant power assets. We started at 12%, um, and that is... I guess, typical of the sort of evolution of risk profile in new markets when um, assets are first, um, you know, brought to market, sold, they start at a high discount rate. But as we have seen in the case of renewable energy generation, as the market becomes more comfortable, as a business model dem um, is, is demonstrated, that yield falls over time. So the, there is an inherent yield compression and capital appreciation potential in the fund. Uh, the aggregation of investments in one portfolio offers uh, portfolio diversification. So we're not dependent on uh, any single one plant, and we can gain extra benefits from having a diversified portfolio on the revenue side as well as on the cost side. Um, there is also capital growth potential from lease extensions. Uh, our projects have lease periods that vary between 25 and 40 years. As we extend those over time, uh, you know, typically the impact is closer as you get towards the end of the lease. Uh, you can, uh, you know, there is a potential to, to add to NAV. And there is also the potential to add to NAV through, as I mentioned, uh, getting additional grid capacity or installing more batteries on the site over time as that, becomes, uh, as that delivers a strong incremental return. As I mentioned, the returns are uncorrelated to the absolute level of power prices. We think this is, an, this is a very important differentiator. Um, very strong asset backing, again, like other renewable energy um, investments, it's between 60 and 70% of, uh, of, of the total capital cost is in equipment. Um, you know, easily movable equipment, the batteries, the inverters, the transformers, etc. And that level rises to actually close to 80% when the cost of the grid connection is also brought into, uh, that, has its, that has a value in its own right uh, into play. Um, scale, with a, with, with a, and first mover advantage, we're the largest owner of these assets in the market, independent owner of these assets in the market. Uh, you know, we're well positioned to benefit from, from scale uh, as we grow our asset base. I mean, we're going from 70 megawatts at the moment to um, 200, close to 260 megawatts by the end of the first quarter of 2020. That will really help. Um, and 
We have very carefully thought about managing the risk reward profile of, of this fund. This is a new market. Um, there, is no, there is no denying that. And um, in our view, um, it was much more suitable to, you know, to, to offer investors a proposition of owning operational assets than taking any development or construction risk. Construction process is actually quite simple, as I sort of explained to you. It's a sort of small footprint, it's containerized solutions, but the development process is very complex. Um, a lot more effort needs to go into designing these plants. Um, and catering for all different types of scenarios. So we, we don't want investors to take that risk. Uh, so it buys fully operational assets, takes absolutely no development risk or construction risk. And quite importantly for, for, for most of you, um, this uh, fundamentally supports the drive towards a low carbon economy. It will enable the further growth of renewables. It will enable a de decarbonization of the energy sector. So it has a positive social impact. Uh, as I mentioned, the IPO proceeds are now fully committed. It bought 70 megawatts of um, operational assets and uh, the rest are committed to the pipeline that we have at the moment. Um, those are shown at the bottom table, the first three lines. And with the proceeds of um, the secondary offering we're carrying out at the moment, we will, we will deploy that into the projects, the four projects shown at the, at the bottom of the table. These are all at, uh, ready, to, ready to build phase. Why is this such, a, uh, such an interesting opportunity? Uh, I'd like to take you through the market, um, the market background um, in, in, uh, at, at this stage. And um, we believe the electricity market in the UK, and actually many other, you can translate that to many other geographies of the world, is at a, key, is at a tipping point at the moment. It's at a tipping point because renewables penetration has risen much faster than forecast. And now is at a level where more than close to 45% of electricity generated comes from renewables. People have consistently underestimated how quickly renewables penetration would rise, and I sh we show that in the first chart. We compare forecasts that were put in place in 2017 by BEIS and forecasts that were put in place in 2019, only two years afterwards. And you can see the huge difference, how much the market has underestimated renewable penetration. Now, this is not just a function of renewables deployment. It's also a function of coal-fired power plants being decommissioned, but the net effect is the same. Low carbon electricity generation that also includes nuclear and biomass now is a dominant form of power generation uh, in the UK and in many other countries of the world. And going forward, um, this picture will only shift in favor of low carbon energy generation um, because offshore wind, there, is, there are still a lot of offshore wind projects in the pipeline that have banked subsidies in the past that are in the construction queue. Furthermore, um, there are developers of solar and wind assets who are not relying on any subsidies uh, for whom the business model makes sense oh, um, simply just uh, you know, selling into the wholesale markets through PPA arrangements. So they're going to be more and more renewables coming, um, coming online. And we're at a point where, as I will show, it's at a tipping point because that has had an effect of a manifest increase in volatility uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the electricity grid. But what volatility now is persistent, and as a result of this volatility, a lot of renewable generation is being wasted. The top chart, chart shows a daily price spread uh, over time in the recent period. There is a clearly increasing trend in, in volatility. That volatility can cause oversupply at times when the wind is blowing. Um, solar power generation is also high, and there's, there's very little energy demand. And it can also create a lot of undersupply because renewable generation, which has now become the dominant form of power generation, is not there to, to meet demand um, in evening hours when, when energy demand is very high. Uh, and this, this situation will, will only get worse over time as, as more and more um, renewable generation is added to the mix. Uh, at the moment, a lot of wind energy is being wasted. Around 6% of uh, wind power in 2019 so far has been wasted, uh, according to our estimates. Um, and um, oversupply, you know, for the designers of the overall electricity grid, you know, if, 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 if you spoke to National Grid five years ago, they had planned the electricity grid so that oversupply would be a rare event. Oversupply now is a very regular event. Uh, we get daily swings into negative pricing. And on the 24th of March, two months ago, we had six instances in one day where um, the power price went negative uh, due, to, um, due to oversupply. 
Investing in battery storage offers a hedge for renewable investments as well. Um, when you think about it, renewable generation is actually a fairly inflexible uh, form of asset. Uh, you have to sell your, pow your power when you generate it. Um, and because everybody's in the same boat, um, times of oversupply are when mo all the renewable generators are generating at the same time, and that leads to a, a collapse in prices. Many of them get subsidies, but there are a lot that have been built in recent years and are, that are being built at the moment, um, where there is a much larger dependence on, on, on power prices going forward. So that's, that creates a huge in, inflexible situation. By contrast, batteries can, um, can, can trade, um, enter the market, whenever there's an attractive price signal or there's an attractive contract in place for the batteries to, to, to yield energy. So batteries offer much more flexibility. Uh, if you look at the first chart, that chart shows the correlation between the amount of wind energy that is produced on the system and prices on the system. As the wind energy price, we show that as um, the, 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 the volatile line, and there's an average line as well um, that sort of goes through that, that smooths that out. Uh, there's a clear correlation between um, power prices and the amount of wind energy on the system. As wind energy rises, prices fall, as, as, um, <clears throat> and, and, and vice versa. And at the bottom chart, we show, um, we show the, what the wholesale power price has done. Uh, in the past, it was mainly one-off spikes uh, due to, due to undersupply. But if you look at the very bottom, which magnifies the recent period, now we're getting a lot of negative prices as well which really works. The reason why batteries are becoming more interesting right now is that it's very difficult to trade undersupply events. Uh, very frequent oversupply events are a lot, a lot more predictable and are a lot more easier to trade. Hence the opportunity is, uh, is, 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 is there at the moment. Um, how do we earn our revenues? Um, we earn our revenues through um, a stacked revenue approach um, and we target uh, five areas. The first area is asset optimization. That is essentially trading in the market through three mechanisms, the day ahead market, the intraday market, and the balancing mechanism. They're all mechanisms designed to um, really where you buy power at a certain price and you sell power at a price where you feel you will get the maximum risk adjusted uh, return. Uh, we, 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 will be, uh, we have started doing this uh, for, for one of our plants. Um, previously, um, uh, our plants were on the uh, earning the fast frequency uh, uh, response uh, service, which I will come to. Uh, and we, we're doing this through working with partners, large energy firms who have been in the trading business for a long time. Uh, the approach we're taking is that because this is a relatively new area, we will work with strong partners first. Um, it means that we, we, we yield a percentage of our revenues, but it offers us the, uh, a much better risk adjusted return. Uh, and asset optimization will be the core of the, of, the, of the revenue stream going forward. Frequency response is a contracted service. The national grid in the UK has the obligation to balance supply and demand at all times. And very short term supply and demand imbalances causes a deviation in the grid frequency from 50, um, 50 hertz on the grid. And there is a service, a contracted service that is designed uh, for um, plant owners to react very quickly, and batteries are ideal for this. A battery is a mechanism that can react very, very quickly to a price, uh, you know, to, to a signal. Um, and that's a contracted mechanism. Uh, the, the, it was our route to market because there were some very, very attractive contract rates in the past. As these have declined, uh, we will be looking to sort of opportunistically um, uh, act in this market, but not in a way that limits our potential to trade. We will limit it to certain hours of the day hours of the day when we're unlikely to either draw or export power from the grid. There is also the capacity market, which is a mechanism under review um, as a result of a, an application that was made by, by one party uh, that uh, arguing that state aid rules were breached. This is a mechanism, um, a 15 year mechanism to ensure that there is capacity on the system to meet extreme needs. It's essentially an insurance policy that's been put forward by the grid. We believe this will come back. It's, um, it's a very small part of our revenue streams, but if it doesn't come back, it will increase volatility. Uh, hence, this is what I mean by the transferability between different, um, uh, different revenue streams. There are also grid-related payments depending on where on the network the asset is located. Different areas have got different specific payments because they might have local constraints. Uh, and this also includes the triad mechanism, which is a mechanism designed to, um, uh, to, to uh, incentivize 
supply and disincentivize consumption in winter periods. And there are also additional revenues that might become available. Certain industrial users want a very, very stable, carefully sculpted power profile. Batteries can do that. We're looking at that for one of our future projects. There's a potential to launch bilateral agreements with transmission system operators like the national grids or DNOs, the local electricity providers, uh, as well as new services that will emerge over time uh, and other bolt-on business activities. <coughs> And these split as follows. We earn around 70% of our uh, revenues from, from asset optimization. Uh, firm frequency response is a, is a smaller part. Again, we will um, act in this market opportunistically. It's only around 11%. Capacity market is 9%. Triads are 7%. But more importantly, this table shows that a megawatt of energy storage capacity that, um, that costs typically between 500, well, 500 to 600,000 pounds all in for, for a 75 minute battery capacity, which is all that is needed for us to implement our strategy, can deliver a revenue yield of between 13 and, and, and 15% uh, over time. Given the high EBITDA margin, this means that a cash flow, we, we can deliver the cash flow yield numbers that I have, I have mentioned. This revenue stream can become more stable as well if we so, if we so choose, because some of the counterparties we work with on trading are at a stage now where they can offer minimum floors, uh, guarantees for, uh, of revenue when, when they work to optimize, optimize our assets for us. Uh, our competitive advantages, uh, I'd like to go through those quickly, um, really at fund level, I think very importantly, we've got an operating history. We've, we've developed, built and operated projects um, our oldest project has more than two years of operating history. Um, many other players in the market don't have that. We've got a lot of data that we've collected that we're analyzing very carefully. We've got a control system that's, that's worked for our projects, with, again, with a two-year operating history. We think that's a strong advantage. Our market share is another advantage. We're the largest owner, and hence we have the opportunity to, to, to deliver um, incremental returns on the revenue side and on the cost side. We've got a diversified portfolio. We're not dependent on one asset. Um, we have a low cost operational structure. Over time, we have developed a repeatable design, putting a lot of work into it. As I mentioned earlier, it's not constructing these sites that's difficult, it's designing these sites that's difficult. That's designing them in a way where they can really switch very easily between different revenue streams is a difficult task. We have done that. And we've got a single control system. What enables us to do that is a single control system that operates, that's capable of operating all sites as one, that, it, that can integrate multiple technologies, batteries as well as um, uh, gas generation where needed, uh, and that can very seamlessly switch between different revenue modes. Our team, um, which is shown later in the presentation, uh, has, been, has got over 100 years of um, asset management um, or uh, finance sector experience between them. Um, the core team has worked together for close to 10 years over 30 years of project development and asset ownership experience. Um, we have des a designed business model and projects that implement that business model. And very importantly, we've got strong relationships with National Grid and the DNOs. Um, the National Grid relationship is very important because it's their mandate to keep the grid stable. It's very important to have that dialogue to understand regulatory changes that, would, that could potentially yield new revenue opportunities. Uh, it's important to maintain a relationship with the DNOs in terms of connecting projects, but also understanding the scope for additional revenue streams on a local level. Um, and um, the other advantage is an understanding of O&M gained from uh, essentially managing, owning uh, renewable generation assets since 2010. That has taught a lot about how risk sharing with contractors, incentive mechanisms, what could go wrong. Um, sometimes it's not the large items, it's the small items. Um, so we have a you know, a long list of experiences we've had of, you know, how small, um, careful attention to very small things that people miss can actually really help uh, protecting, protecting revenues. Uh, our trading partners, those are the parties I mentioned who we work with on the asset optimization side um, to, to trade in the market. They've got big teams who are focused on this with, with a lot of experience. Uh, we, can enter into, we are entering into deals with them. Uh, where, where risk and, and revenues are shared in a, in a fair way in our view. And our focus as a team is really the revenue potential, increasing that, keeping a good alignment in place with the fund, um, clearly separating out development and asset ownership activities, 
through independent processes and verification, as well as um, bringing down costs. Um, I've, this is the case for the upside return. We can go from 8% to 15%, mainly through leverage, which brings in 4%. Uh, optimization income, there's an additional, there's a potential to bring another 1% 1 from there. From lease extensions, there's a potential to bring another uh, 80 basis points. And through O&M cost reductions, there's a potential to bring another 20 basis points of uh, incremental return. Very important component is a company called Norica Power. We're in a joint venture with them for, um, uh, for project development work. As I said, the design process is very complicated. And uh, this is a team of people who've got very strong experience in control system design and also operating energy sites, designing them. Uh, we work very closely with them in the project development process to ensure that the construction process is, 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 very, is very simple. We get good prices and we can transfer risk uh, well in EPC contracts that we, that we negotiate, with the, negotiate with EPC counterparties. They're also a very large um, uh, stakeholder in the fund. Uh, they own around 3% of the fund. All of the team members, um, myself, Ben Guess, Gareth Owen, we're also large investors in the funds. Um, so we're, we're strongly incentivized. We have a very large percentage of our own personal worth uh, in, in, in the fund. To conclude, um, I think you know, through the NG Storage Funds, uh, we're offering um, the opportunity to participate in what is, what is a very clear, in our view, irrevocable trend. And that is the growth of renewables on the system. Low carbon energy is a dominant form of power generation. And inevitably, that is uh, yeah, leading to increased volatility. This is not a thesis. We're experiencing that now on the grid. Hence the opportunity to capitalize on that right now. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's an asset-backed opportunity with diversified cash flows. And very importantly, it's not correlated to power prices. Our view is that in the long run, these are going to fall. And um, not having exposure to that, or at least hedging exposure an investor has through investments in renewable energy funds is, I think, an important differentiator for this. The fund provides essential infrastructure that supports the government in meeting its long-term targets. Uh, it offers an optimal, optimal solution to deal with the inter intermittency of renewables um, and, and managing stability on the grid. Uh, it's got strong asset backing. Um, as Gresham House, we've got proven expertise because we have operated these uh, for, for over two years. We've got a ready-to-build pipeline uh, which will, um, you know, which, we, which once built will be sold into the funds. We don't have to go and, you know, now that we've raised the money, go and scramble to find these opportunities that creates a very significant cash drag uh, for investors. We don't have that problem. Uh, and uh, very importantly, there is a potential, um, there's a potential for this to follow what every other infrastructure opportunity has followed, new infrastructure opportunity has followed, which starts at high returns. But as the asset class becomes more mainstream, there is a potential for this, for energy storage to grow by, by, by 30 fold on the electricity grid as a result of um, renewable penetration. And we show that on page, page 19 um, in the chart, in, in the presentation. We're coming in early and um, uh, this, this, this offers the, you know, the potential for, for yield compression, capital appreciation, as well as a regular dividend stream. Um, I'd like to conclude the sort of prepared remarks here and just, just take questions from you. Um, my question is on the durability of the, uh, the revenues. Um, what do you think are the biggest risks uh, to the revenues of the fund? And also as an, another question, whilst I've got the microphone, is to do with the um, state subsidy issue around the EU and the, uh, the capacity market. Uh, well, where are we on that in terms of the EU and the ongoing debate about the viability of that? Mm -hmm. uh, let's start with the, um, the, the risks to the revenue streams. Uh, really, there are, you know, there, 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 are, there are two major risks. One is you know, market and, and regulatory risk um, and counterparty risk uh, 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 on, on one hand, and there's also operational risk on the other hand. The first is about if we operate well, can we own the revenue streams? The second is even if the revenue streams are, are there, can we, you know, can we own those revenues? Um, with the first, I think we're encouraged. When the sector first started, it was mainly on contracted mechanisms. So uh, we started off by with very attractively priced FFR contracts that drifted down over time. As the market realized that it wanted to move to a much more market-force-dominated market mechanism. 
and asset optimization is that we're essentially buying and selling power in the day. There isn't a regulatory, regulatory framework that can, that, can, that can strongly affect that. There is, we're front of the meter, uh, you know, we, we have uh, supply licenses, we can, we can enter, we can, we, we can trade power. What could happen, of course, is that, you know, as with any other opportunity, um, you know, capital markets are very efficient here. You can have more and more assets that are that, that come online and gradually compress that daily spread. However, we take comfort from precisely this chart that at the moment there's around 450 megawatts of front of the meter energy storage capacity in the UK. Um, that's set to increase um, very, very rapidly. I mean, within uh, over 30 fold by 2020, uh, by, by, by 2020 and then and, and going forward from that point um, as well, a very, very strong increase in flexible generation capacity. So. Um, I don't think growth will, will, will catch up fast enough for that revenue stream to, to narrow. We've got several years of very, very strong um, power price, daily power price spreads in, in front of us. We take comfort from the diversification. So if that happens too slowly, volatility will stay and the national grid absolutely has no choice but to stick to its mandate of ma uh, maintaining price stability. So it can stop. Uh, it will have to go back to contracted services, which are Plants are designed flexibly so that they can switch to that kind of revenue mode. Um, and, you know, the other side is really, you know, the growth of renewables. I mean, there's so much growth still in the queue. Uh, projects that have already banked subsidies, so there's no risk of losing those, they will be built. Uh, they're being, they're, a lot of them have been financed, so that growth will continue. Um, on the operational side, uh, we focus on, 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 on really acquiring plants, which have been built by very good EPCs under... EPC contracts that transfer risk very well over to the EPC contractor through mechanisms that punish them if the site isn't properly designed and properly constructed. We put a lot of emphasis on insurance against business interruption cover, against extreme events. And we put a lot of emphasis on what we have learned operating and maintaining um, renewable sites, uh, really focusing on the small things that could be very small to, to you know, cost could be very small in terms of maintaining them, but uh, if, if we get it wrong, it can, it can really affect revenue. So we apply that knowledge there. So um, we believe those are the key risks. In terms of a capacity market, um, that, that process is still ongoing. Um, I think our view is that the, the, um, the system needs um, standby capacity to, uh, to, to cope with very extreme events. Um, if, and, but if it doesn't come back, we're not very dependent on that. And, you know, the, the loss of that revenue stream, which amounts to around 7%, will be compensated by what we will earn on asset optimization because extreme events will get more extreme. Um, and we're positioned to be able to, to, be able to benefit from that. Uh, thank you. Just a couple questions about how you could be disrupted. So national grid might be nationalized soon if we're unlucky. Uh, and I've recently seen that Shell is providing electricity services, and that suggests they might have a lot of idle-handed engineers that could turn their mind to what you do in a scale that's far beyond, at the moment, what, how you're operating, unless you were lucky and they bought you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think we've seen that in, 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 in renewables. I mean, these start as sort of typically small industries that are where independent players are active. And over time, energy companies re realize that they have to be in this market as well to hedge their ownership of energy generation assets and exposure to power prices. And there's no question that over time they will go into this market, but we haven't seen too many signs of that happening yet. Typically, the path that is followed is that they, they wait for um, established, you know, for independent operators to sort of establish themselves, deliver a bit of scale, and then come and buy those assets um, and, you know, grow on the back of that. Um, we've seen a very similar thing happening in the energy electric vehicle charging space. I mean, it's a sort of much more nascent industry to this, but uh, you know, rather than you know building out their own infrastructure, they've tended now to sort of acquire what other people have done and build on the back of that. But there's there's absolutely no doubt they're going to become uh, important players in this in the space as well. They have to, to to be able to diversify their revenue streams. And national grid being nationalized. That's. That you know, that's that that's something which is, is is very difficult for us to predict. But even if it were nationalized, the mandate to you know to maintain grid stability cannot go away. They they still have to have the same mandate. Um, 
they still have to procure if and if their access to capital goes down as a result of nationalization, which I think is a big risk for national grid, then they'll be reliant increasingly on external parties to be able to provide the function that they need to provide uh, to stabilize the electricity grid. I mean, it's very difficult to predict because, you know, in an extreme event like that, you don't know where dominoes will ultimately fall. But it's clear that their access to capital will, will come down if, if, if that happens. And the fact that the mandate to manage electricity supply and demand that's not going to, you know, that's not going to go away. They still have that mandate. Oh. Right. So the technology question is that you're in a period of growth and you say you've been operating equipment for two years. What about the equipment that you're using? What is the history of its stability and reliability and the service providers to make sure that equipment keeps working? Sure. Th and, thank and you. in yeah. addition to your point about BI, which is good. Yeah. Th thank you for that question. Um, if we look at the main equipment, that's the transformers, the inverters, and the batteries. Now, inverters and transformers have a very long history of operating, so they're not complex equipment. They've been around for a long time. Um, and, you know, we have experience of managing plants with inverters that go, goes back 10 years. Um, so we're not too worried about that, but we do try and get the longest possible and best warranty terms from manufacturers. And we don't, when we buy projects, you know, go to the sort of more extreme ends of things in order to reduce costs. The, the aim is to buy equipment from the best manufacturers. So for instance, of the existing fleet, inverters have come from SMA uh, and, um, <coughs> uh, and from, from Emerson, uh, uh, which, is a, which, are, which are well established companies. The same goes for transformers. They've been around for 150 years almost, actually no, 130 years. And, um, you know, we get good warranties, we work with good manufacturers. With batteries, it's arguably a bit different. Um, Lithium-ion technology has been around since the mid-90s, but how long has it been applied in scale, of this kind of scale? Um, how long has it been applied where you can you put four megawatt hours into one container? Um, uh, you know, that, that operating history is much more limited. But again, we minimize that through working with the best manufacturers, LG Chem and Samsung other manufacturers we work with. Again, we don't go to the sort of other scales of people who offer cheaper solutions. And very importantly here, we insist on 10-year warranties. So we have warranties that are uh, very carefully designed that tell us what parameters we have to stick to. But as long as we stick to those parameters, we have a 10-year warranty for those batteries. So with the batteries, we have to be much more careful about managing the precise risk that you have. And we do that through very long warranty terms. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.